the question we ended the last video with was what is entropy really? The scientific abbreviation of entropy, going back to when it was discovered in the 18th century, is S. And delta is the mathematical notation traditionally for the change in something. It's actually the change in entropy that's defined, not the absolute level of entropy. And the mathematical scientific equation for entropy is this one. The change in entropy delta S is for a particular object is the heat flow divided by the temperature. We define the heat he, heat flow as being positive if heat is flowing into the object. We define heat flow as being negative is heat, is, if heat is flowing out of the object. So if heat is flowing into the object, the object is getting warmer. If heat is flowing out of the object, the object is getting colder. Temperature here is measured as in, in most areas of physics in Kelvin. We used to say degrees Kelvin, but now we just say Kelvin. Uh, that's the scale at which zero Kelvin is absolute zero, so roughly minus, I think it's 273 degrees Celsius. And so heat flow divided by temperature, the mathematical expression of that is delta H divided by T, so delta H is the heat flow, which again can either be positive or negative depending on whether heat is flowing into the object or out of the object, divided by the temperature. Now one of the biggest problems with entropy is that it's hard to say on an intuitive level what this means. Uh, Lots of, the th lots of the things we study in physics, like, for instance, uh, velocity, acceleration, have expressions in the real world. You know that if a car is going at a constant speed of 40 miles an hour, that that's its velocity. You know that if, you, if you're driving and you push on the gas and the car starts going faster, that's acceleration. Push on the brakes, it's negative acceleration. So lots of ideas of physics have everyday intuitive interpretations. But delta H divided by T doesn't actually seem to really have any everyday interpretation at all. And we will see that this is what has gotten people into trouble, uh, people who try to interpret it into trouble. But let me start with a simple illustration of a physical phenomenon that everybody knows that can only be explained by the second law of thermodynamics. Why does an ice cube placed on a hot sidewalk on a summer day melt? What's the reason? The first law of thermodynamics, which is conservation of energy, uh, just says that energy is going to be conserved. So delta H of the sidewalk plus delta H of the ice cube is equal to zero. In other words, uh, heat doesn't get lost. So heat flows between the ice cube and the sidewalk, and whatever heat is lost by one of those bodies is gained by the other. But the first law of thermodynamics doesn't prohibit heat flowing from the ice cube to the sidewalk and making the ice cube colder and the sidewalk hotter. The ice cube is not at absolute zero. You know, the ice cube is probably, what is a, 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 a freezer in somebody's kitchen, it's maybe something like 280 Kelvin. It's way, way, way above absolute zero. So there's heat in the ice cube. And, and the first law would allow the heat in the ice cube some of that heat to leave and go to the sidewalk, making the ice cube colder and the sidewalk hotter. We know that doesn't happen. But the first law would allow that to happen. The first law doesn't say it has to happen, which is good because it doesn't, but the first law would allow it. I claim that it's the second law that tells you the direction of the heat flow. So think about the second law. The second law says that 
delta s, that there is a change in entropy of the combined system, is positive. You know, the second law says that uh, entropy is increasing. So, in an isolated system, entropy rises. And, and for simplicity, we'll assume that we're talking about an isolated system. So, entropy rises. Entropy is delta h over t. So, delta h over t for the sidewalk plus delta h over t for the ice cube has to be greater than, greater than zero, so entropy rises. Now, let's say that, let's just use the letter x to denote the heat that's exchanged between the sidewalk and the ice cube. And what we know from the first law is that uh, whatever, whatever heat is exchanged, what, what, the heat change of the sidewalk is equal to minus the heat change of the ice cube. So there's no heat gained or no heat lost by the system as a whole. If we take x to be a positive number, so think about x being positive, then these are the two possibilities that we have. Let's say that the temperature of the sidewalk, which is hot, is 350. And the temperature of the ice cube, which is cold, is 280. And so the terms that relate to 350 are the sidewalk terms, and the terms that relate to 280 are the ice cube terms. And the, f the first expression here says that it's the 350 term that, that is the sidewalk term that has the positive x. So the sidewalk's getting hotter, and therefore the ice cube is getting colder. And the second one, the 350 term, which is the sidewalk term, has a negative x. So there the sidewalk is getting cooler, and the ice cube is getting warmer. Now, mathematically, which one of these things is true? The, the, first, the first statement or the second statement? Well, if you divide by 350, you reduce the absolute value of the numerator by more than if you divide by 280. So if you want to think about it, the term that has the 280 is going to win in terms of the sign. We want the sign to be positive. It's the second expression here where the more important term, the term that's going to be that's going to be most powerful in absolute value, largest in absolute value, is 280. So that's what's going to quote unquote win. The 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 correct mathematical expression is going to be this one. Because the the term that's biggest in absolute value is x over 280, and that's positive. Whereas over here, the term that's largest in absolute value is minus x over 280, and that's negative, but we want the left-hand side to be greater than zero. So, so the first term is not going to the, the first expression is not going to work. It's the second expression. But so so the, so the second expression is this this is like, this is the like correct one, and it's the one where the 350 object, which is the sidewalk, loses heat, and the 280 object, which is the ice cube, gains heat. So that's the scientific explanation for why an ice cube placed on a sidewalk on a hot summer day melts, because heat goes from the hot sidewalk to the ice cube. And if you think about what you know about physics and chemistry, there's no other law in science that explains why an ice cube placed on a hot sidewalk is going to melt. So the second law of thermodynamics tells us some important things about the real world or explains in a scientific manner important things about the real world. Now, how about measuring entropy? Well, it turn, turns out you can, here, you can measure the change in entropy of a one cubic centimeter chunk of copper going from, say, 300 Kelvin, which is roughly room temperature, to 400 Kelvin. By the way, a Kelvin degree is the same magnitude as a Celsius degree. So this is from roughly room temperature to 100 degrees Celsius above room temperature. Here's the way you would answer the question, what is the entropy change of a cubic centimeter of copper? going from 300k to 400k. You imagine the taking the, the cubic centimeter chunk of copper 
and putting it over a Bunsen burner. So here you got a Bunsen burner and you have a gas flame. And suppose you know the the BTUs per minute of heat that are being released by the gas flame or BTUs per second, the metric unit here would be joules joules per second. So that's the delta H, that's the heat flow. And suppose we enclose this in a cabinet which is insulated so we don't have to worry about heat going anywhere else. And we know because we know the rate at which the natural gas is being burned in the Bunsen burner, um, we know this, we know the joules per second heat flow, so we know the delta H. And suppose we also have some kind of thermal probe on the, on the um, cubic centimeter of copper so we can measure the temperature. Suppose we measure how long it takes to increase the temperature from 300K to 310K. Yes, so we know, we know the delta H that's required because if we know how much time it is then we can find the energy input. That's, let's form this. So that's the delta H, the energy that we've added to the cubic centimeter of copper divided by 305. 305 is halfway between 300 and 310 so that's going to be an approximation of the entropy change of the copper as it went from 300K to 310K. Now, now let's go from 310K to 320K. Well again you can measure how many seconds that takes because you know the rate at which energy is being introduced into the system, you can get the delta H for that. Uh, so if we call the first one delta H1, the second one is delta H2. So that that's this term, approximately. We have delta H2, and I divide by 315 because 315 is, is an approximation. It's halfway between 310 and 320. Well, you keep on doing that. Now measure how many seconds it takes to go from 320K to 330K and that will give you delta H3 divide that by 325 so dot 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 the final one delta H99 divided by um, th by, divided by 395 and then add all those up and when you add them up that's the answer to the question that's the entropy change of one cubic centimeter of copper going from 300K to 400K. Now the point is not for you to memorize that procedure. The point is that as I write a little bit farther here down, entropy is not a mystical concept. It is concrete and quantitative. You can measure entropy changes in a laboratory. So while there's there's actually been a lot of vagueness in common understanding of what entropy is and that's how it got used in poetry and literature entropy to a scientist is not a mystical concept it's something that's quite concrete now if you ask me what does delta H over T really mean intuitively that's a hard question to answer, but we don't have to have intuitive understanding of every concept in science. It's fortunate that we have intuitive understandings of lots of concepts in science, but we can work with mathematical equations even if we don't have an intuitive understanding of what they mean, and certainly we can work with entropy. Indeed, tables of these kind of entropy changes for different materials appear in freshman chemistry textbooks. Now sometimes they don't appear as entropy changes. They appear as changes in what's called Gibbs free energy. But Gibbs free energy is just entropy multiplied by a constant. So f from the point of view at least of physicists, perhaps not of all chemists, but um, Gibbs free energy changes are essentially equivalent to entropy changes. So tables of entropy changes for different materials appear in freshman chemistry textbooks. So you want to know 
the entropy change of a mole of copper as it goes from 300k to 400k, you just look it up in a table. Why do freshman chemistry textbooks have this? Well, indeed, it's knowing these the entropy changes of different materials at different temperatures, plus the second law of thermodynamics that turned alchemy into chemistry. That basically is the distinction between alchemy, which was the medieval study of how things combine into the science of chemistry. So imagine you've got three hypothetical materials, just call them A, B, and C. In the days of alchemy, if you wanted to know whether A and B would combine to produce C, you'd have to get your hands on A, get your hands on B, and, and put them together and see whether, uh, whether they combine to get C. Now, suppose that um, maybe we know a little bit of chemistry, and we, see, and we know that in theory, uh, these, uh, this reaction could occur, but what we want to know is, does it go from left to right, or does it go from right to left? In other words, which is the, which is the natural direction, which is the spontaneous direction? Um, before the second law of thermodynamics, you, just, you had to go into a laboratory and just observe. But now, you don't have to go into a laboratory and observe. You can look up tables of entropies for A, B, and C, and if one mole of A plus one mole of B has um, lower entropy than one mole of C, then if the reaction goes from left to right, entropy increases, the second law says entropy goes up, so there you are. That's the way it goes. And if the entropy on the left is larger than the entropy of C, then the reaction goes the other way. So again, entropy is not a mystical concept, and it plays a fundamental role in chemistry and chemical engineering. Uh, we'll also see in the next video, uh, although I won't talk about this as much, um, its, uh, its role in mechanical engineering. But in this next video, we'll take this scientific understanding of entropy to get to get back to these ideas and ask to what extent they're correct or incorrect.